find ourselves at 7, and we will be beginning on page 31, kind of 30, 31, we'll read, read through once again those words of 1 Corinthians 7. Um, but let us begin with prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit had his way with us. Your will was done, and we were brought to faith. May your Holy Spirit continue to dwell in our hearts by faith, continue to overcome our sinful resistance, soften our hearts by your word, and keep us on the path that leads to eternal life. Amen. So we pick up here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Are you looking for that too, Brad? So that's what you need there, Brad? There you go. Yep. You're welcome. We'll, we'll pick up there with 1 Corinthians 7, um, and we had a chance to jump into it um, a little bit last week. But we'll be beginning with the searching the scriptures questions. But in order to be able to do that, it'll be good for us to hear those words of 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 9 once again. So we'll read those first. Now concerning the things you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of sexual sins, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband is to fulfill his obligation to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, her husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, his wife does. Do not deprive one another unless you both agree to do so for a time, in order to devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. However, I say this as a concession, not as a command. For I wish all people were like me, but each person has his own gift from God. One person is blessed in this way, another in a different way. I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain as I am. But if they do not have self-control, they should marry, because it is better to marry than to burn with desire." <clears throat> So what reason for marriage does Paul give in verses 1 and 2? Annette. Sexual yeah, to avoid sexual sins. Um, he really says there would be a reason to, to marry, to avoid those. Um, if you are, are burning with passion, um, then, then marry. Consider verses 3 through 6. What understanding about the nature of the marriage relationship is stated in these verses? Evan. Um, and so really what the Lord is saying, what Paul is saying here through the, through the um, inspiration of the Spirit is that because husband and wife have become one flesh, they belong to each other. You know, it's not only their own needs, but the needs of the other that is to be considered, especially when it comes to the, the sexual side of things. Um, that's what... That's what he's talking about when he says, your body is not your own, don't deprive the other. Your body is not your own, don't deprive the other. Um, you belong to your wife, you belong to your husband. And what other reasons for marriage do the following Bible passages give in addition to the ones supplied here? Um, we read verses 2 through 4, and now let's look at Genesis 2, 24. Would someone like to read those words. Rachel. For 
So the one that's supplied here, the one that's supplied there in Genesis 2, 24, it says the reason for marriage is this is a place for what? God-pleasing sexual union. And why is it that marriage is the only place that this sexual union can actually be God-pleasing? It's not just simply the fact that God says so. Um, it is one of the reasons, because God says so. But it's actually only in a marriage that this sexual relationship can actually be in a committed and selfless giving form. Because in any other context, it's always just a taking. It's always just selfish. But within the marriage, it can be within that committed, loving, and selfless, and self-giving relationship. It's the only place. Um, Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Would someone like to read those words? Go ahead, Nancy. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. First Timothy 5.14. Someone? Annette. In Psalm 127.3. Evan. Sons are heritage from the Lord. Children are reward from God. What's another reason for marriage? Another blessing? Children. Children. Correct. And then on the top of page 32, we read Genesis 2. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Another reason for marriage and blessing is companionship. Um, and so the Lord institutes marriage for the, the blessings of a God-pleasing sexual union, for the place for children, and for the place for that companionship. Digging deeper, we really kind of touched on question A last week when we said what reason might someone have for choosing to remain unmarried. Um, we talked about the fact that a person might have more opportunity, more time to devote for service to the Lord. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the coming sections as well. Um, we said that maybe a person would say, well, we're, we're living in difficult persecution times, and the last thing that I want to do is to, to bring children into this situation of where there's going to be this persecution, and so they decide not to marry. And we, we spoke of how the Apostle Paul, you, could you imagine, had he had a, a, a wife and children, um, the heartache, the ups and downs, the roller coaster they would have gone through as Paul is put into prison, as, as, as he is beaten and, and, and as he put on trial for all these things. And, and how it would have, would have just you know, taken away some of his, his time to be able to devote to the ministry in that regard as well. Um, but we said in connection with that, which we'll see actually when we get to chapter 9 here in 1 Corinthians, is that many of the apostles, though, were married, and many of them took their wives along with them on their missionary trips as well. Um, but what we didn't look at is um, question B there. In what ways might a congregation meet the particular needs of un? married adults. Um, and, I, and I ask that because I think there, the temptation can be, or um, I don't know if the temptation is the right word, the, the unfortunate result sometimes can be that unintentionally, or perhaps even somewhat intentionally, at times um, the, the single adults can kind of be depre um, not appreciated. Um, or even deep, what's the word I'm looking for? Devalued, there it is. Um, I don't think there's a depreciated, is it? I don't think there's a word. Um, so, so devalued 
in, in that aspect. And, and so what can, what can congregations do to meet those particular needs? Evan. And face social harbor, so the social activities. Um, one thing I'm going I'm to speak to that you, that you said there, and nothing wrong with it, but I think sometimes this can happen also within congregations, and that is there can be a bit of an undue pressure um, that's been put, that can be put upon um, the single ones as if they, they, there, there's something wrong, why aren't you married? Because um, you made the comment, you know, so they can meet someone. Well, you know, the whole goal isn't to say, let's have these activities so you can meet someone because you, we need to get you married. Um, you know, that's, that's putting this undue pressure. It's, it's actually kind of um, really not, in a way, perhaps meeting the needs because you're actually, in the whole process of it, um, trying to, to force something, perhaps, upon an individual. Not that it's bad. Not that it might be a good thing for them to be able to meet somebody, but we don't, our, our goal isn't to say, how do we get these single people married? Um, Annette. So even just the way in which we word things, in the way in which we, we um, include individuals or include, include that in those announcements. Yes, Rudy. And so there's, there's an advantage of, of being able to include them in that, that aspect. Um, I think that's a delicate balance at the same time to make sure that we don't just burn somebody out. Um, I have, I have a, a sister who is, is single and, and a teacher called Worker. Um, and I, I know of others who have been single and, and have expressed, well, everybody in the church just assumes I'm single that all I want to do is spend 24 hours, seven days a week here at church to, to do this, that, and the other thing. And so there can be those aspects of where you actually burn an individual out in that, in that regard. Um, now let's take that, that idea um, and this question, but let's take it and remove it from just simply this aspect of be, beyond Bible study, beyond work within the, the church, beyond recreational activities, social activities. Um, think of some times in the life of an individual um, who is a single adult when it would be um, especially valuable to reach out to them on certain occasions. Yeah, holidays. You, what do we think about? We're, we're always thinking about our holidays and how, how we're going to go to this family or that family or this family's coming here and we're going to spend time with them. Um, the single adult? maybe has no one. Um, there's a way that a congregation um, can, or individual believers, can be looking out for those, those needs of the unmarried. Um, what, others, what are some other, maybe, occasions? Evan. So if, yeah. so if they're if they're if they're moving, um, you can kind of look at that aspect of how often don't don't we in the aspect of moving if we're we're a family we, we try to get people together once again um, you know depending on on the individual they might have buddies who can come help them but you stop and think about especially perhaps a single a single lady um, 
and they're moving. Who's, who's doing all that work? And that's another one. Um, hospitalization, right? If, if, if you're hospitalized and you have a family, who's coming to visit you all the time? Your family. Um, if you're hospitalized and you don't have a family, who's coming to visit you all the time? Um, you're sitting there laying in that bed all by yourself. Jesus, Jesus is there. Um, but I'm talking about the physical presence of a fellow, fellow human being. Um, and so, you know, keep those things in mind um, when it comes to, to those aspects within our own congregation. As, as the Apostle Paul speaks, speaks about the aspect of it's, it's, it's good for people to remain single if, they, if they're able to. Um, not, you don't have to marry, but at the same time, um, we recognize there's some things that they might not be able to, to have that those who are married do have. Um, any questions or comments there on that first section, verses 1 through 9? I see I only have one bank of lights on. Um, I should go turn the other bank. All right, thank you. Um, it'll get darker here in a few moments. Um, so we'll turn our attention then to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, verses 10 through 16. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, it's a little bit different. But we begin there in verse 10. Next, I command the married. It is the Lord's command, not mine. And, and when the Apostle Paul um, gives that a bit of a aside, it is the Lord's command, not mine. He's, he's simply referencing the fact, and if you, if you notice, <clears throat> this is down there in the notes too, if you're, if you're wanting to, to put anything down there. What he's really referencing is the fact that there's other parts, especially when you think about the, the Gospels, but there's parts where Jesus has specifically spoken to this matter. Um, and so he can refer the people back to specific words of Jesus. Um, and so there's specific words of Jesus that talk to um, this aspect of divorce and not leaving um, you know, a relationship. And so he can refer them back to it. So it's the Lord's command. Um, that helps us understand what he says then a little, little bit later. So next I command the married, it is the Lord's command, not mine. A wife is not to leave her husband. But if she does leave, she is to remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But I, not the Lord, say to the rest. Um, so here, what he is saying is that the Lord doesn't have a specific prior statement to it because he's going to go into this aspect of mixed marriages. And he's going to say, yeah, there was words for the Old Testament Israelites, but, but you don't see those words in the Gospels that he specifically speaks to this. And so Paul becomes the spokesperson for, for Jesus. This is not putting any type of a um, doubt into inspiration. I mean, finally, the Apostle Paul is speaking under divine inspiration here. Um, he's not interjecting personal thoughts or uninspired words. He's just simply saying, there aren't words that I can refer you back to that Jesus himself spoke on this matter. So, but I, not the Lord, say to the rest, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she is willing to go on living with him, he is not to divorce her. If any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to go on living with her, she is not to divorce her husband. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified in connection with his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified in connection with her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not bound in such cases, and God has called us to live in peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? And, and note the example that Paul never gives. In the whole aspect, he, he says nothing about the believer and the believer, husband and wife. He only speaks about in terms of the believer and the unbeliever. What's the whole idea of the fact that you never see him talk about it? He says, it's not even fathomable 
Um, we shouldn't even think about it, that a believer and a believer should be thinking about divorce. Um, and so he doesn't even touch on that. He's simply speaking about the believer and the unbeliever. And we'll see what he's saying here in, as we look at these questions. I'm searching the scriptures. So what advice does Paul give Christians who are married to unbelievers? And, and think of this especially in the aspect or the context of this um, section. And that is, as Paul comes into the city of Corinth, as he proclaims the gospel message, the wife comes to faith and the husband doesn't. They were already married ahead of time. Or the husband comes to faith and the wife doesn't. And, and what, would, what would be perhaps a thought? The unbeliever would say, well, there's a stigma to being a Christian. Do I really want to stick around? Or there might be the believer saying, well, now that I have come to faith, and now I recognize I'm married to a, an unbeliever, now what? So what advice does Paul give Christians who are married to unbelievers? Annette. The advice he gives is, Remain in that marriage unless the unbeliever breaks it. You know, make every effort, make every reasonable effort to preserve that marriage. Don't look for ways to get out of it. Um, and then he even goes on to say reasons why, um, which we'll touch on in a few moments. So what legitimate grounds for divorce in a mixed marriage does Paul recognize? Rachel, if the unbeliever simply leaves, uh, this is oftentimes referred to as malicious desertion. Uh, it's one of the two things that Jesus speaks of in the Bible that would say to the believer, you have the right to seek and get a divorce, um, and you are not guilty of breaking my law that says I hate divorce. Because ultimately, if an individual is unfaithful to their spouse, the Lord says um, the believer may get a, seek a divorce. Um, and if the unbeliever leaves, they are deserting the relationship. Now, let's give a definition to this aspect of malicious desertion. Rachel. So when, when one individual within the marriage all by themselves makes the marriage impossible, that would be malicious desertion. When one individual, um, this isn't a case of where both individuals are, are, are bickering and quarreling and then they're both um, in the moments of frustration say, well, this is what, and that's what I'm going to do and this is what I'm going to do. This is not one individual all by themselves making the marriage impossible. Um, and Paul gives an example. If the unbeliever says, um, hey, you know, honey, we live here in Corinth. I'm moving to Galatia. I don't want you to come follow me. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're leaving the marriage. Um, and it's not upon the believer to go chase down the unbeliever and say, what are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm going with you wherever you go because we got married. Um, if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. Um, a, a malicious desertion could be, when you consider what the apostle Paul says earlier in this section, he, he says, your, your body's not your own. So if a, if a um, husband or a wife and there's no health issues, no health reasons, but says, I'm going to withhold the marriage bed. No, I'm, we're not going to have any sexual relationships. I, I don't want to. Um, that's part of marriage. And one individual says, no, I'm not going to share my body with you. That would be one making the marriage all by themselves impossible. Um, but this is not the same as somebody saying, well, you made me upset yesterday, so no, I'm not going to. And then the next day, the other person says, no, you made me upset the other day, so I'm not. And that's both people acting in an unloving, improper way. Um, abuse could certainly fall into this category as well. Um, if, if you have an individual that is, is abusing um, an individual or maybe even putting the lives of children at risk, 
But even in those situations, what is the Lord's desire, first and foremost? Is that the one who is being abused would do all they can to say, what help can we get so that you can change and not do this? Um, and, and so you seek to do all that you can. But if none of that changes, um, that too. Um, you know, much different than the irreconcilable differences that are oftentimes simply spoken of today. Um, and so I know that sometimes in the courtrooms that's what's going to be said, even though in the, in the real life that maybe is, is not what has happened. Um, but notice two things the Lord says would be cause for divorce, um, and that's it. Gemma, I saw your hand up. Yep. Desertion. Did you want to explain further? <laughs> I think, if I'm not mistaken, when we had opportunity to um, go through class together, we maybe not had, maybe did not um, specifically speak to it. Um, But here is, a, here is an aspect of where, where um, by the grace of God, you have come to know what his will for your life is and what he wants you to do. Um, and, and in coming to know that truth, we also unfortunately come to realize where in our lives we haven't always lived according to that truth. I know. Um, but what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that in the situation like that, um, the, the Lord is, it doesn't matter how long ago it was, but what the Lord wants us to do is to recognize where I was wrong and where I was not living according to your will, Lord, is I lay, I lay that sin and every other sin at, your, at, at the foot of your cross. Um, and recognize that Jesus went to that cross to, to die for that sin there too. And then um, the Christian says, coming to know what God's will is for in my life, now my goal is to um, make amends where I'm able to, to reconcile where I'm able to. Um, that's the way in which the Christian would, would respond. And so, Gemma, it doesn't change my, my, my view of you at all. Um, but rather a case of saying, I, I thank the Lord for working the heart of faith in you to say, I, I, that's not what I should have done. Lord, forgive me. And then for you to know, he has. Yeah. Rachel. Um, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question um, that I don't know that I'll go into great detail with simply for the fact that every situation is, is very unique. And um, we, we could come up with a lot of hypotheticals that, that are, are very, um, if you want to say, difficult um, hypotheticals that, that to a degree might tie our, our hands behind our back, so to speak. Um, and I think far more is the case of simply saying, um, in those situations, what would be the path that an individual would want to take in order to get help within the relationship? Um, and then if, if an individual continues to refuse to get help, then you start talking about a different, different case because now all of a sudden, are you getting to that point of where we're saying they are making it impossible because of their refusal in those aspects? Um, so I think that's probably the best way to answer it just because of the difficulty of answering a hypothetical.
And I'll see if I if I speak directly to your question. I'm not I'm not sure if I, I you know I know what you're referring to. Number one is 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 we're we're going to be comparing not apples to apples because um, you know ultimately um, under that theocracy and if you recall the, the 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 Pharisees tried to use that against Jesus and what was Jesus' response his response his response was simply um, the only reason Moses gave a certificate of divorce is because the people's hearts were hard ultimately what is he saying they were unbelievers. Um, and so, so what did he do? He, 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 he wrote into, I mean, read, read through, read through Exodus, right? And in, in the laws that he, he, he gives for the, um, the civil laws that the Lord gives to the nation of Israel is, is he gives laws totally understanding that sin's going to be um, a part of their lives. You know, and, and so, so here that aspect of Moses giving a certificate of divorce um, he, he allows for it, and he, he speaks to it in that regard, not because it changes at all in any way his desire and design for marriage, but because their hearts were hard. Because what was going to happen if he didn't? Well, then you would have this individual over here who decides he doesn't want to be married to this woman over here, but instead of getting a certificate of divorce, they'll just go over and shack up with this woman over here, and you have even more sin uncompiled upon sin. And so for the sake of that, he, he allows it, um, but not um, as an aspect of saying, hey, um, I, I thought about marriage differently then. It was because their hearts were hard, because they were unbelievers. I don't, did I speak to your kind of your question? Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, ultimately, if, if an individual is seeking divorce and, and um, they're, they're going to go through with it, they're acting as an unbeliever in, in, in impenitence. And that's, that's, why, that's why Paul is able to say what he says here, too. Now, the goal, of course, would be is that the individual, individual who acts in impenitence, that um, an individual... But the believers would approach them and say, hey, um, this is not the way that the Lord wants you to act, and, and that that person would be led to repentance. Um, and then, you know, you go back to verses um, 10 and 11, and you'd say, in verse 11, what, what the Apostle Paul is really speaking about there, he's acknowledging the lifelong intention of the marriage commitment, um, as he talks about, but if she does leave, remain unmarried, because the whole goal would be reconciliation if that person recognizes that they were wrong. But also recognizing reconciliation isn't always possible. Who gave the certificate of divorce? Just the high priest? I don't know that... Um, whether the, 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 the Jews in their historical records would have, have looked at um, back and have that. But I, I think the best thing is for us just to simply stay with the scripture. And, and the Pharisees speak about, and, and Jesus speaks about Moses giving the certificate of divorce. And if you recall, Moses, Moses was the one who sat there um, as, as, the, as the judge in, in many of those respects until his father-in-law finally came to him and said, hey, um, Moses, if you keep this up, you're going to burn yourself out. Um, find some people that are, that are um, spiritual that can serve in these capacities, and, and they can listen to these, these lesser cases, and if they can't decide it, then they can come to you. So I think we just leave it with Moses. Yep. Turning our page to the Digging Deeper questions. In what way... Is an unbelieving husband or wife sanctified by a believing spouse? Evan. Uh, what do you think is that a believing spouse can pray on behalf of the entire family, even if the unbelieving spouse cannot communicate with that? So praying for the unbeliever. Um, there would be a way in which the believer would, would be having that godly beneficial effect on the unbeliever. I just have, uh, can you give us the 
definition of sanctify? Um, so sanct sanctify and sanctification has the idea of being set apart. Um, and, and so sometimes you'll hear it referred to as set apart as holy. Um, but the word sanctify itself is, is the idea of set apart. Yeah, because I didn't understand how they made them holy. Um, and so, but, but if you think about um, the unbeliever, the unbeliever in a marriage would be receiving all sorts of blessings within that marriage, blessings that, quote-unquote, they wouldn't have deserved otherwise. Uh, and, and so in the whole process is... What happens is the believer can have a godly influence on the unbeliever. And in the long haul, as, as the apostle says in the end of that section, is who's to say that perhaps that godly influence would even lead to an individual coming to faith? Um, did you want me to use it, or you want to tell it? So, I mean, it's and, and, and in, in our own family, um, well, Rachel's especially uh, an, an aunt and an uncle. Um, you know, very much a case of where the believing um, spouse had a godly influence on the unbelieving spouse and, and came to faith. Um, and so you, that's what he's referring to yeah, in that aspect. I, I, yeah, I understand the example, but it almost makes it sound like it happens just because when I read that, just because he's married to her, he becomes sanctified. It's not necessarily... A, there. Correct. Um, however, understanding the idea of sanctified as not, own, not simply coming to faith is it does happen automatically in the sense of when the, the godly spouse lives godly, the unbeliever is receiving benefits from it. Um, and that does happen automatically. Or, or even think about the aspect of the godly spouse um, and the effect that the godly spouse will have on children. Um, in that regard, too. Did I see another hand? Rudy. Yeah. Um, we, we don't want to ignore... Um, I, I've got a question coming up, so I, I'll steal it. I don't want to steal it right now. So let's, we'll come back to that thought. Um, point B, would it be better for a pastor to be unmarried? Rachel has her hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel. Yeah, um, when you could say a, a pro on that side of it is there wouldn't be the need to juggle family responsibility um, with the ministry, right? Um, but you could probably put some cons down there too. Evan. And think about what, think about what happened. It's, so instead of you know maybe taking your your very your very good example, but then drawing it out to this this aspect is is think of what happened with the legalistic legalistic aspect of don't marry, is that not all of those priests were given the gift of being able to be celibate, and what happened? The burning with passion showed itself in ways that were totally improper, um, in, in the improper actions with, with um, people within congregations or with children within congregations. And so a con is, is certainly, if, if you make this a requirement, is that it may lead to all sorts of other 
problems if that, that pastor would be burning with a passion. Um, what other cons would it be for a pastor being unmarried? Yeah, an opportunity to set an example in that regard, and, and it's hard to set an example if um, you, you are not married in that re regard. Eli. Oh, I thought your hand was up, and then, and then, and not only that, but Evan was also pointing to you. I apologize, I apologize. Um, nothing, nothing worse than being called out when, called on when you, you aren't ready, ready to answer. Um, yeah. Um, and, and then you think about it, too, just even, you know, what a blessing if, if, a, if a pastor is able even to, you know, be able to enjoy the blessings of marriage as, as it's spoken of in Scripture, you know, the companionship and, and the, the children and all those, those aspects that go, go with it as well. Questions on that section before we move on to our next Verses 17 to 24. However, each person is to live in the situation the Lord assigned to him, the situation he was in when God called him to faith. And so, really, the Apostle Paul continues in this section by simply saying, um, one should not feel the need to change their vocation just because they've come to faith. Um, you know, and any God-pleasing vocation, there's not a need to leave it. Um, because in that vocation, you'll be able to, to serve. Um, so however, each person is to live in the situation the Lord assigned to him, the situation he was in when God called him to faith. I give the same command in all the churches. If a man was circumcised when he was called, he should not become uncircumcised. If a man was uncircumcised when he was called, he should not get circumcision, circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping God's command is, commands is important. Let each person stay in that calling in which he was called. Were you a slave when you were called? Do not let it bother you. But if you are able to become free, take advantage of it. For the slave who is called to be in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Likewise, the free person who is called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers, let each person remain before God in the situation he was in when he was called. Um, there in verse 23, it says, do not become slaves of, of men. Um, what would that be? Well, it'd be disobeying God's commands in order to please humans. Um, it says, don't, don't become slaves of men. Um, your goal is not to please people. Your goal is to please the Lord. Question one, Paul speaks of slavery in verses 21 to 24. In Paul's day, slavery was a legal practice. Note verse 22, how would this verse help a slave be untroubled about his or her <coughs> situation in life? Evan. Yep, and, and, and so 21 says, if you have the chance to be free, go ahead and be free. But what about 22? How does verse 22, how would verse 22 help um, a slave be untroubled 
um, about his or her situation in life as a slave. What does the Lord ultimately say there, Dave? Okay, um, and, and take that thought. So then take the idea of being the Lord's freed person. What does that mean? It'd be... Correct. Yeah. Um, and so what is he ultimately saying is that whether you are a slave in the economic status of the, of the life that you live right now or whether you are um, a master or a wealthy um, slave owner, your economic, economic and social status means nothing before God. What matters is that your sins have been forgiven. Um, and that's ultimately what he's saying to them. Um, economic and social distinctions in this world are immaterial to God. Um, you are the Lord's freed person. Slave owner and slave are alike to God. Um, and the slave who believes and the slave owner who believes, well, they are alike. Uh, that status means, means nothing. They both stand beneath the cross of Jesus on level ground. Um, and so, so ultimately what, what is being said, and I think there's an application for us here um, in, in our, own, our own aspects, our own, our own churches as well, is ultimately... No one is inferior and no one is superior. Um, and isn't that a good thing to keep in mind when it comes to relationships within a congregation? Um, no one in that congregation is superior to anybody else in that congregation. And you're not inferior either. Um, and and then there's an application that I, that I could see in this aspect too, is in the whole section of what the Lord has to say here, of saying, you know, in the, in the status where you are, is do we ever perhaps give the air of a superiority when we, when we expect somebody who comes into our church to adopt Wells' traditions immediately or to adopt them at all? Um, you know, tradition is nothing more than that. It's tradition. Um, but, but is there times when, when we, we give off this, this impression that, well, because I act this way, and this is how traditionally we've always done it, that somehow my worship is superior, or I am superior um, to what you are doing. Um, just because somebody might, might um, do, do worship a little bit differently, does not make them inferior um, to another one who's done it this way all along. Yes, Evan. Um, touching on that, talking about the fact that in our services, he needs to be, whether Fedrath, uh, St. Paul earlier, like St. Paul, I remember, was a relatively short service because many of the song lines were actually spoken because of the older population that there was more speaking in the liturgy than there was singing. And that often was different than the Wackerberg location where most of that liturgy was sung. So it was just that something that if, when you, another example is like uh, rise at if, if you are able, because sometimes we have people who might be wheelchair bound or who might not be and recognizing that those things are traditions, um, that they're, they're not commanded. And, and I, I, I make the comment just last week down in, in Cataract, you know, but isn't it funny how sometimes if we sit for the prayer of the church and then we say the Lord's Prayer while we're sitting, is there any of you that thinks in your mind just a tiny little bit, is it okay for me to say the Lord's Prayer while sitting down? <laughs> um, the answer is yes. Um, it is perfectly fine. Um, so we want, to be, we want to be careful with that as well. Um, digging deeper. Question A. In these verses, especially verse 17, Paul gives the principle that has profound implications for all Christian life. 
Um, what is this principle? Especially verse 17. Annette. To live in that circumstance in which the Lord has given to us. And be content in that circumstance that you have. Um, you know, verse 24 is really the key, the section. Um, let each person remain before God in the situation he was in when he was called. Remain before God. Um, you know, remain in whatever situation and, and serve the Lord there. The follow-up question that then we see, how does that principle that we just looked at in A find itself in the phrase, bloom where you are planted? What's the idea behind that phrase? Rachel. What was the second thing you said? Okay, um, continue where you're at, continue to grow. Um, what else can we say that blooming where you are planted is? Yeah, whatever situation that we find ourselves in life is a situation where the Lord's going to give us opportunity um, to be God's person and to do God's work. And whatever situation that you are in. Um, and, and you think about that. Rather than expending all this energy to try and get out of the situation you're in, really what the Lord is saying is, expend all of that energy that you would in trying to get out of the situation to actually use the situation that you're in to serve them. Um, every honorable situation that we're in is a promising situation to serve the Lord. Um, everyone. Um, I believe, I, and I, you know, I, 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 I borrowed, I didn't steal, I borrowed the phrase, I believe um, from, from Mrs. Wenland, Kathy Wenland, who wrote the book, Bloom Where You Are Planted. Um, as, as she, she served as a, a missionary's wife. Um, and, and um, all right, here you go. Um, I'm in a foreign country. Um, rather than thinking about how I missed all of my comforts of, 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 of America, here's where I can serve the Lord um, as well. Yes, it came before the, the other one that said blue mayor plant, I'm pretty sure. See, I can read. I can read her face. <laughs> the second point under there: Does this mean a person should not seek to get out of a difficult situation? And take note of our section here as well. That'll help in, in, in formulating that answer. Eli. I like, I like the way in which you, you said, um, should the opportunity um, present itself. It, you know, being discontent um, is different than walking through a door that the Lord has opened for us. And did you notice what he said to the slave? If you have the opportunity to get your freedom, by all means, go get your freedom. Um, it's not wrong for us to try to get out of a difficult situation. Um, but the thing is, is that if we're in that situation and that opportunity doesn't present itself, then what is the Lord saying? What is Paul saying to us here? Is, you know, you can confidently and with enthusiasm serve in that position that you are in. Um, and isn't that really where this, this contentment truly comes from? Um, rather than looking out there and saying, everything else is better, Here's where I am, and here's where God has planted me. Let me serve him here. Um, point B. 
Paul's counsel to slaves does not mean that he or the Lord approved of slavery itself. Um, what assessment of slavery do you find revealed in this section? And kind of found in that aspect of what he says to the slaves, too, if that opportunity of freedom comes. That must not have been a great thing if he said, hey, if you get a chance. Yeah. Um, slavery is at odds with, with God's view of human beings. Um, God is not condoning it. He's not, Paul's not condoning it and saying, hey, this is the way things should be. He's simply writing um, to a society where this was part of life. Um, but we recognize that freedom is really what the Lord would want. Um, then, question C, note the dual position of Christians. In verse 22, it says, we are both what and what? We're both freed people and we are servants. Freed people and slaves. Freed people and servants. Free and slave at the same time. That's our dual position. What implication does that have for us in, in our, our lives and how we live? And of course, the key in understanding that is, is what is meant by freed people and what is meant as, as being this slave. Um, we talked about the freed people. Freed people is what, Evan? I'm going I'm to I'm stop you there, um, because actually that's going to fall under the side of servant. Um, freed. What are we freed from? We're freed from sin. Therefore, ultimately, what are we freed from? We're freed from the obligation of trying to save ourselves. That's what it means to be the freed person. We are freed from the obligation of trying to save ourselves. That has huge implication in our life. We're saved by grace through what Christ has done for us. We're freed from the obligation to try and, and save ourselves. Therefore, since we are freed from the obligation to try and save ourselves, now we can actually be a slave. A slave for what? Now we kind of come to what you were saying there before, Evan. Now we can be a slave who gladly and willingly serves God. And how do we serve God? We serve God not only by worshiping, but we serve him as we carry out those vocations in our life. And as we do so to the glory of God, as we do so for the well-being of our neighbor. Um, this was a huge, huge point um, for Martin Luther in many of his writings, um, that we are at the same time a freed person who is a slave. Um, but a slave to God, which is not a sla slave at all in a, any bad sense. Um, freed from the obligation to try and save ourselves, and now we are servants um, who can actually live for God in our vocation in different parts that we, we have our lives. Um, let's still try to take this next section. Um, we have about five minutes. We won't, we won't rush, but um, we'll get closer to our end here. Then, 1 Corinthians 7, 25 to 35. Um, I'm going to touch on the, the points of the notes as we go along here. So, now concerning virgins. Um, so, so many believe that as the Apostle Paul writes this section here, um, that he's answering a specific question again. And that question was something, um, should, should virgins really plan to get married at this time? And so he goes and says, now, now concerning the virgins... I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment. So now notice, not taking away divine inspiration, but recognizing Paul's giving a judgment. This is not a command, and therefore the people do not need to obey it the same way as if the Lord had given a command. And that's why we can rightfully say here at the beginning of our whole section of chapter 7, to marry or not to marry, all depends. Um, Paul gives a judgment, but it's, it's more than just, you know, oh, the opinion of some guy. This is also a man 
who, by the grace of God, was spiritually mature. And so his judgment should be taken into consideration. Um, much like, um, for, for lack of better um, um, illustration or example would be, is you know, if somebody were to come into my office and, and ask an opinion that where God doesn't give a command, um, one, would, one would pray that rather than just sitting there to get the opinion of, of this person that happens to sit in the office in that building called faith, um, would be, well, I, I, I pray that he would be coming from a standpoint of letting all of God's word kind of um, influence the, the suggestion or the judgment that would be given. Um, so here's Paul giving that, that judgment. But they don't, they're not obligated to heed it. They don't have to do it. So I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy made worthy of trust. Accordingly, I think this is good because of the difficult situation we face. What difficult situation? We don't know. But the Corinthians obviously did. Um, the Corinthians um, knew that there was some difficult situation. And some trying time, which would lead the Apostle Paul to say, right now it might be better to delay marriage. So that's ultimately kind of where his judgment is. Because of the difficult situation we face, namely, that it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be freed. Are you unattached? Do not seek a wife. But if you do get married, you have not sinned. And if a virgin gets married, she has not sinned. Yet such people will be under pressure in their earthly lives and I am trying to spare you. I also say this, brothers, the time is short. Uh, certainly, this could apply to any moment before the Day of Judgment, but here in the context, it would seem to apply to this difficult situation. Um, this difficult situation, it seems to be temporary. Um, so, you're not going to be saying, um, or you're not going to be thinking that if you decide to delay marriage, that it's going to be this way forever. It seems like this time is, is short but we could apply it to any moment before the Day of Judgment. For the time is short. From now on, let those who have wives live as if they have none. He's not demeaning marriage. He's not speaking poorly of marriage. Um, he's simply saying to them, and we'll see this at the end of this section, he's simply saying to them, um, married people are to keep their Lord first not their spouse. From now on, let those who have wives live as they have none. Those who weep, as if not weeping. Those who rejoice, as if not rejoicing. Those who buy, as if not possessing. And those who use the world, as if not getting any use out of it. For the way of life that belongs to this world is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. The unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord and thinks about how to please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about the things of the world and thinks about how to please his wife. And so he is divided. The unmarried woman and the virgin are concerned about the things of the Lord, so as to be holy both in body and in spirit. But the married woman is concerned about the things of the world and thinks about how to please her husband. I am saying this for your own benefit, not to impose a restriction, but to encourage honorable, undistracted devotion to the Lord. And that last phrase is the key, the whole section, is whatever is going to help you devote yourself to the Lord, this is what is key in all of it. Let's see if we can't take the questions real quick. Paul applies a general principle to marriage in verses 29 to 31. Um, what's the general principle? Annette. Keep the Lord first and Yeah. Because the world's passing away, Keep your eyes focused on eternity. Let the Lord be first. Um, the Christian's attitude is this. The world is passing away. And since it is, that includes relationships are passing away, jobs are passing away, possessions are passing away, joys are passing away. Um, ultimately, he's saying, the things of this life are, are temporary. Appreciate and use the things responsibly, but don't hold on to them too tightly. Um, 
And so you, you think about that in the, in the aspect of, of relationship. Um, while that relationship is, is a blessing, while the Lord has words in Scripture that talk about the way that you are to live and treat one another within that relationship, and while the Lord even speaks about, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, that the closest thing that can come to, to speaking about this awesome unity that exists between Christ and his church is the marriage, is that that is still also still passing away, um, that relationship. And so don't cling to it, to it too tightly. Um, what is Paul's point in verses 32 to 35? I can start it, you finish the sentence. Don't let marriage responsibilities get in the way of your responsibility to the Lord. Um, here's the fact of life, Paul says. The married person has distractions from their marriage. It's just the way it is. He's not saying it's bad. He's just saying that's the way it is. Um, but don't let those responsibilities which you want to take seriously. But don't let them distract from your responsibility to the Lord. Your Lord still must come first. Digging deeper, under what circumstances may marriage be inadvisable for the Christian today? It was inadvisable in a way to some of the individuals at this time. Rudy. When it you from the um, it would be inadvisable if it was an aspect of where this, this is going to pull my, my faith away. Um, you know, and so kind of come to a, a question that we'll we'll have to wait till next time. You know, is it wrong for a believer to marry an unbeliever? We'll we'll answer that question. Um, but it'd be inadvisable if it's going to destroy my faith. Absolutely. You've probably heard before that, let's say, boyfriend, girlfriend, both believers, let's say that boyfriend, girlfriend, um, unfortunately give in to um, the, the flesh and, and girlfriend gets pregnant. Just because girlfriend's pregnant does not mean automatically that they should be married. It might not be the best thing at all. Um, you know, it's not just a case of saying, you know, if, if they fall into this sin and, and they're really not people who should, should be married, um, it does not mean that they just automatically, because one is pregnant, that they should get married. Um, and somebody once said, two, two wrongs aren't going to make a right. Rudy. That means a child for It doesn't have to be. Um, the child can still be raised by, by them, um, but you know, just just because um, she got pregnant does not mean that they should live in a loveless marriage, or a marriage that's going to end in divorce. Uh, there might be advice. There might be um, there might be some wisdom to advising you know a couple that that um, where where one is just going to be deployed right when they get married. Um, that maybe you wait, just, just for that, you know, it, it's, once again, um, Paul gives a judgment, and we could say that there is a judgment in that aspect. Um, inadvisable is not saying it's a command from God that you don't. But there might be some aspects in those situations of where, um, and maybe it's an aspect of where they, they weren't really talking about marriage yet. And then all of a sudden they find out that he or she's being deployed. And all of a sudden they say, oh, let's get married. Mm, why don't you wait? Why don't you wait? Um, that would be godly, good advice. Um, does not mean it has to be followed, because there's not a command that says don't get married. But it might be advisable not to at that point. Um, question B, on the basis of what we have read in chapter 7, and, and notice my, my underlining and my bold, so there's lots of things we could say, but uh, on the basis of what we've read in chapter 7 so far, 
What advice might you give to two 20-year-olds who are entering into marriage? So you're kind of thinking back to, to what we've looked at here in chapter 7. All right, I think there's absolutely something that we, we've seen here in the section that we've, we've been reading, is even before your spouse, make the Lord number one. And I... Discuss, yeah, discuss these things that are, are the blessings that the Lord gives in, in marriage. Um, those are things that we want to discuss prior to being married rather than after being married. Rudy. Okay, I'm going I'm to take that and, and run with it because it will fit in this aspect too, is put selfishness aside, right, and put your spouse before the needs of your own. Didn't we see that? Um, you know, your body's not your own. It's not my needs that I'm only looking at, out for. It's yours. Um, and yours in the, in the sexual aspect, but yours in the spiritual aspect too. Remember, you're entering a lifelong commitment. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those aspects, if, if, if an individual enters a marriage with the thought process that says, well, if it doesn't work out, I can always get out of it, um, there's a, probably a great chance that marriage is going to fail. Um, you're entering with a lifelong commitment in mind. Um, and, and I think another thing, and it's kind of um, interesting, I, I know one, one pastor who in, in his, in his um, premarital counseling will, will always remind, will remind the couple, um, you know, don't use sex as a weapon. Um, you know, it, it is not something to be used um, to withhold from somebody that you're upset with. Um, you know, it's wrong to deprive the other of satisfaction for selfish or punitive reasons. The Lord very specifically speaks through, through Paul here as in that aspect. Let's read that summary and then we'll end. Um, thank you for 10 more minutes here tonight. So a summary of this section provided by the People's Bible. I just took this right out of the People's Bible. I thought it was, was nicely written. Do not be taken up with the affairs of this life. That includes even the marriage relationship. Intimate and, ab and absorbing as it is, our marriage commitment cannot transcend our devotion to our Lord, nor can life's sorrows and its joys or our business and our possessions supplant our concerns for our heavenly treasure. <clears throat> The things of this passing world dare not displace our eternal good. We do not try to get everything out of this life, lest we forfeit our eternal inheritance. So, good place for us to stop, or a place for us to stop. We didn't quite get all the way through chapter 7, but we'll, we'll finish it up, um, and then we'll jump into our next chapters next week, Wednesday. Let's close with prayer. Holy Spirit, you have joined us with believers on earth and in heaven. Teach us to long for our reunion with the saints in heaven and to value our fellowship with your followers on earth. Cleanse churches everywhere of sin and error so that we may find many more with whom we may join in the blessings of your word and work. In the name of Jesus, the Lord of the church, we pray. Amen.